YouTube and welcome to another pre-solo Britain test video. Uh, this is the fourth one and this has to deal with the emergencies and communications. Um, getting these videos done as soon as I can and uh, again this is for those who want to review Private Pilot pre-solo written. Uh, your flight school might do it in a slightly different way. They just have to cover the same type of material according to the FAA rules. And uh, yeah, I'm just doing the questions that I was given for my pre-solo. And uh, if you're not going for your private pilot, still is not a bad thing to learn this stuff to enhance your uh, flight simming ability. So here we go. Okay, so our first question for the pre-solo written for communications and emergencies is, how much fuel do you need to have for flying? Uh, it really depends on the plane because each plane um, burns gas differently. However, we're going to go with the Cessna 152, which approximately burns six gallons per an hour. Uh, so, on a VFR day flight, calculate six gallons per an hour for the flight time. Plus, you need an extra 30 minutes of fuel, um, more than your actual flight time calculated in there. That's what the FAA requires if you're on a VFR. Uh, flight during the day. If it's a VFR night flight and you're in a Cessna 152, again, it's calculated six gallons per an hour for the flight time that you're going to be flying, plus 45 minutes of fuel extra in the plane. So if you notice that if, if you're doing a nighttime flight, you need an extra 45 minutes instead of an extra just 30 minutes. So that is a big difference on what you need. The second question in the pre-solo written uh, communications and emergencies is what are the steps in the proper sequence to respond to an engine failure, loss of power, or engine sputtering? Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want, you want to maintain the best glide speed. Uh, again, that is aircraft dependent. And in the Cessna 152, which is what I fly, um, best glide speed is equal to 60 knots. And if you notice, I indicated that with the B uh, speed there on the slide. Second thing to do is to find the best place to land. You're looking for fields, you're looking for uh, any airports in the area, that's, that's number one. If you can land in an airport, that's the best bet because they have the services you need and uh, you have air traffic control and everything. But you'll have more services at the airport rather than a rural field or a road. But your main deal is just to get down safe and land a plane. Uh, the third thing that you want to do is you want to refer to the checklist emergency procedure. All checklists should have emergency procedures for engine failures, uh, fires, um, and, and other um, emergencies. The big thing here is that if you, if you have to take the test, the written test, you want to remember the ABC rule, which is just covering the same thing in, in a more understanding way. So the ABC rule is one, to make sure your airspeed is where it needs to be. That's the first thing you want to do in an emergency. Uh, two, find the best place to land. And three is refer to the checklist. That's the ABC rule, and that will help you memorize this. I'm going to include this next slide with um, number two, question number two about that. But you also want to know some other things to know when you have an emergency. Things that every pilot should know is that you have a frequency, 121.5 is the universal emergency frequency. If you dial in 121.5, someone's going to know that you have an emergency and, and they will uh, communicate with you. They will get you what you need to deal with your emergency. And that happens uh, anywhere, basically, where you're flying. Uh, transponder squawk codes are important to know for emergencies. You definitely want to set the transponder, which is where you put your squawk um, codes in the plane so they can identify you. But you want to set that on standby before you dial these in because if you accidentally run through one of these, such as hijacking, before you get to radio failure or emergency, you will let them know that there's a high, possible hijacking before you get to the actual transponder code you need. Set the transponder to standby, and then dial in uh, these following numbers for your emergency. If you just have a general emergency in the plane, you want to put 7700 in the transponder. If you have radio failure and you can't contact anyone, you can still let them know by squawking 7600 on the transponder. 
and they will um, try to communicate with you in different ways. And the last one, probably the most serious right now, especially in this current climate of the world, if you dial in 7500 into your transponder, it means that you have a hijacking. That is not something you want to fool around with, obviously. And if you are a sim pilot and you're simming with that sim, they do not allow you to recreate a hijacking on your plane. So that is a no-no in the flight sim world if you're on that sim, which is an online air traffic control system. The other things you want to know for Mercy, when you're going in for Mercy landing, you want to secure the plane. There are four things you want to remember. You want the fuel off, you want your mixture lean, mags off, which is your basically the key in the engine for the mags. You want that off. And the master should be off unless you're in contact with air traffic control because you want to remain on the frequency with them so that they can monitor your progress on your run seat. So things to know for emergencies. Okay, the next thing under communications and emergencies is knowing your frequencies for your home airport and uh, other notable ones that you need to know. So all these questions are going to be related to Plymouth, Massachusetts Airport for me because that's my home base, that's where my flight school is. And so the question on my pre-solo written was, what's the Unicom frequency for Plymouth? We have a Unicom, which means that basically uh, you dial this in to communicate with pilots. It's an uncontrolled airport. There's no air traffic control at Plymouth. So therefore there's one frequency in which we all talk on and many airports share the same frequency. So like you'll uh, Block Island and Rhode Island has the same Unicom frequency. So you have to hear where the pilots are. They'll say like uh, Block Island's runway five, and then you're like, oh that's Block Island, so I have to worry about that from landing because I'm at Plymouth. But the Unicom frequency for Plymouth is 123.00. The next thing that they wanted me to know on the pre-solo written was the weather briefing frequency. Plymouth has an automated system and the frequency to contact that for weather is 135.625 and that will give you the weather report on radio. The next frequency I was supposed to know from my pre-solo written was the Alpha 1 frequency. Alpha 1 is the name of my flight school so you, they want you to know the flight school frequency to contact the flight school and that's 123.3 and finally they wanted me to know the runway light activation. Um, unlike the simming world where airports mostly have their runways lit up if they're lit in the real world. In the real world they have a lot of airports if not most have radio controlled lighting so the lighting of the airport for the runway will be off unless you dial in the frequency and push the button to communicate a couple times. And the runway light activation frequency at Plymouth is 122.9. So again, just the difference between real world and uh, simming. Simming, the lights will be on all the time. You can see them from a distance. You don't have to activate them. The next couple of questions are just straight ahead. Next question is, how can you check that your radios are working properly? You always do this when you get in the plane and, and you're running through the whole checklist to start the plane after you get started and you run through that, you want to check your radios are working. So a possible thing that you can do to check that your radios are working properly is to ask for a radio check of the Unicom. So I'll just use the plane that I fly as an example. Uh, this is what we say on the Unicom frequency. We'll say Plymouth Ops, Cessna 990, radio check please. And then they will communicate back with me and say that my radios are good. And I'll just call back and say, thanks Cessna 990. You can also hit the test button on the radio. A lot of radios have test buttons that just check and make sure that, that it can be heard. Most of the time I just check it over Unicom. And then basically if you want to make sure that you're receiving on the radio, you can check your weather frequency, your ATIS, your ASOS frequency at the airport. The next question is, in what conditions can carburetor icing occur? Basically, it can occur between 20 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit with visible moisture. That's the general answer. If you actually go into the books that we have to study for private pilots, they'll highlight the fact that the carburetor icing can occur even to 70 degree Fahrenheit heat. Or, you know, that's pretty hot. You wouldn't think, oh, I might, I'm going to ice up my carburetor. But it could with 80% humidity. 
So just to let you know, just because it's warm outside doesn't mean that you can't get car pee. Uh, so some people are the beginning pilot to remember. The next question is, uh, what are the warning signs of carburetor icing? Basically, you'll lose RPMs and you'll have a declining airspeed. Okay, and our last question for communications and emergencies is, if you have carburetor icing and you turn on the carburetor heat, what can you expect to happen? What, what you're doing is you're trying to get the ice out of the carburetor at that point. That's what you need to do. But you're going to notice a drop in RPM even more when you turn, turn the carb heat on. And you'll have a loss of power in the plane until the ice is clear. Carb ice is nothing to fuss with. And that's why you learn by studying the private pilot materials what you need to do and, and what to look out for and that's why it's in the pre-solo written because you need to know that if you're going to solo and you have these conditions. So that's it. Those are the questions on communications and emergencies of my pre-solo written. We'll keep exploring pre-solo written as we go along. The next video should be out pretty soon and I thank you for watching. Please continue to watch my videos. Please subscribe on the link below and I'll be making more videos in the future to help us with all our endeavors in the flight simming world or even in the world of the private pilot or even if you just want to find out more what it's like to take um, private pilot lessons. So I will see you in the future.